Let's stand together and sing a hymn of calling. See the words. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, each of us have been blessed this morning by being able to wake up. We are so blessed to have a place to come together as a church family to worship you. Pray that we have an open heart and mind to receive the word that will be shared by Brother Tom. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Did y'all get any rain last night? All right. Right, it's a good-looking family out here. You know, that's something maybe up here on the front row, I don't know. If you're a visitor, <coughs> if you look in front of you, you'll probably find a little card like this. We'd like for you to uh, you know, fill it out, and you can add any comments you know you would like to, and just drop it in the plate when it comes by. If you need a ride, and you're listening on Facebook and YouTube, YouTube 
Uh, if you need a ride, we do have a uh, the bus that can pick you up. You just call the church office at 359-4077. Put my glasses on if I can read the rest of my notes. Uh, at the time, we're getting ready to stand up and greet. So if you see someone that you've never seen before, please go speak to them. And a word for the deacons on the front row, would y'all make sure that they can get up. Thank you. <laughs> Stand and drink. <laughs>
Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, two verses, verses 9 and 10. Peter is writing to those Christians who were scattered all over the Roman Empire and wanting to encourage and strengthen them. He wanted to help them understand who they are in Christ. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May God bless to our good this reading and hearing of his word in scripture. I was wise, dear gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, we're just so thankful for this day, this beautiful day of life that you've given us. We thank you for the privilege, Lord, to come into your house, to study your word, and hear your word proclaimed. Today, as we go through this worship service, help us to understand Jesus is the eternal, the personal, and divine word of God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, we are reminded, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word. Help us to understand that Jesus is the creative word of God. In John 1.14, we're told, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Lord, just open our hearts and our minds. Give us receptive hearts to today's message that we may, if we lay on our hearts, it will sink in and we may carry the word of God with us each and every day. Help us to live the scripture of James 1.22 as we are told, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And in doing so, we may be as promised in Matthew 7.24, whoever heareth these words of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house on the rocks. Lord, we know and we understand that your word is stronger and truer than any word spoken. In Hebrews 4.12, we are reminded that the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Lord, we're just so thankful for your word. Lord, your word provides all that we need. It provides food for our soul, shelter during the storms and tribulations of our lives. Lord, your word provides light into our paths as we travel through what we consider dark and lonesome pathways. Lord, your word provides faith, the faith that we need to carry us through all of the tough situations we encounter. Lord, your word provides salvation, eternal salvation, as we're reminded in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he only gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Yes, the eternal life that we so richly long for. In closing from the words of Isaiah 48, we are told, the grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of God endures forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. <coughs> let's, let's stand together and sing We Are Called to Be God's People.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings that you bestow upon us. I pray that we may give with gladness and serenity. I pray that everyone who will look into their hearts and act in the obedience of you. We thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for bringing us all here safe. In Jesus' name, amen.
the Build a Bridge campaign is important because for anyone that goes to this church, you can see that it's primarily older citizens. Um, so I think it's important to reach out to maybe the younger group, and that's something that Clint and I are hoping that we can do and help with, but I feel that church is beginning to diminish in so many people's lives because, you know, I wasn't brought up in church, so I can imagine there's a lot of people like me out there that weren't brought up in church, and it's not necessarily they haven't been introduced to the Lord, but maybe they just don't really like it. They don't like the idea of having to commit coming every Sunday or Wednesday night, but hopefully Build a Bridge can show that the activities here for children and for adults, it's fun and it gives you fulfillment and it's something that you can have family time with and you can grow a second family. It's more about what we're supposed to do at the Great Commission. And we have had several play scenes done. Uh, we've had youth go on mission trips. We've had Carpenters for Christ. Uh, we've gone and helped in certain areas where the hurricanes were. Those were our communities, but we really need to do a little bit more, and that's what we're supposed to be doing with this campaign here, here in our local community. Um, we have several churches but yet the people that are near and dear and close haven't ever heard. And that in itself is not the Great Commission. We, we focused on far away, and now we're gonna be focusing on home. And that's where we're at here is home, whether it be across the street or across the, the city or you know maybe in Shelbyville or Columbia, but that's still our home and that's where you've got to focus. And I think that's what's gonna be so good about this campaign. We're continuing in our emphasis on building bridges to our neighbors on this particular Sunday. We're gonna talk a little bit this morning about the call of God it ought to be a matter of, of importance to all of us, something that we are considering uh, uh, as a part of our personal devotional and, and discipleship experience. Um, I'm going to be referring some to 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10, so you might want to open your Bibles to that uh, passage of Scripture just so that we can uh, refresh our memory of what it was read a few moments ago. I want to begin by asking a simple question. What is the call of God? And once again, it's so, it seems so basic, it seems so, so ordinary that you might wonder why is the preacher asking what is the call of God? And my sense is that we have to frame that question in order to really capture some of the significance of what it is. If we have to frame that question in a biblical context, and especially in the statement that says the, what the nature of the church is. The church is many members, but one body. And so if you think of this gathering of people in this place, this, this is just kind of a microcosm of what the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is really all about. But the many of us are together in one body. Uh, we're kind of like the tip of the iceberg because the body of Christ transcends this place of meeting now. But we are many members and one body in Christ. That emphasis upon the one body in Christ encourages us to ask a couple of questions. What does the Lord want us, that is his church, to do? Something that we need to work together to decide that we need to discern together, that we need to begin to put in place as we go about doing the work that we as a church of the Lord Jesus do together. So what does the Lord want us to do? But since we are many members but one body, there's a second question that has to do with ourselves. What does the Lord want me, his person, to do in this context? Uh, the truth is that that God has designed the body in such a way that there are no 
useless members. There are no unneeded members in his body. All of us have something to do, a function to perform, a work to do as a part of the body of Christ. And, uh, and so that's where this question of what is the call of God, uh, that's where it becomes kind of important for us. Okay, let's see. I just made my stuff so big it's off the screen. Let me see if I can. There we go. Okay. Love technology, don't you? Okay. To, to boil it down to in its most simple terms, is the call of God is what he wants us to do. Not for him, but with him. He doesn't just kind of gather us together and kind of ball us up and throw us out into the world and say, now, go do it for me. He wants us to join together and unite with him in the work that he's doing in the world. After all, it is his mission to seek and to save the lost. It is his work in the world that he involves us in doing. So the call of God is what he wants us to do with, with him. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we read that God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, you've got to think back to your lost days, to the time before you met Jesus. That's, that was darkness. That was when you had no spiritual understanding whatsoever, no sensitivity to the things of God, no even real desire to know God or inclination toward God in any way. That's, that's what darkness is really all about. Darkness is a, is a place where you just can't see, where you just don't understand, where you don't know, where evil resides. That was, and God has called us from that condition of darkness into his marvelous light through Jesus Christ. Now, Peter says that God has a purpose uh, for calling us, for so calling us from darkness into light. And that purpose is to proclaim his excellencies so that you are no longer for yourself in living in this world. And, and that's, that's a tough lesson that all of us will spend a lifetime figuring out how to do that. How can we live with less and less self-interest and more and more God interest in the living of our lives? How can we go about talking about how wonderful he is how beautiful he is in all of his excellencies, how great it is to know this God who spoke the world into existence and called us into being as his child. How, how can we do more and more of that and let our lives be dedicated to such a wonderful purpose as that? We'll spend a lifetime figuring out how to do that, how we can, how we can do that. So, But Peter, Peter says that God's purpose for so calling us, is that we might proclaim His excellencies. Think of that word proclaim. That word proclaim sounds like what the preacher does. But guess what? It's not just the preacher who is called to proclaim the excellencies of the Lord who called us out of darkness into light. It's the people in the pew who have a message to share with the people around us, with folks in our neighborhood. That's exactly what we're called to do. All of us have a proclamation. We are sent as, as people to proclaim this message. So think about that as your responsibility and, and factor that into your understanding of how God is calling you. Now, by virtue of his calling us, he gives us a wonderful new identity. Um, so we are, it says on your, uh, on your uh, listening guide, it says we are, but I want you to insert a couple of words there that I should have put in there, but I did not. Uh, insert the word Christian. We Christians are, and then we're going to define what we Christians are. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Because of our new identity, that's why we have a message that we can proclaim to our neighbors. But this, these beautiful words, these were first spoken only to Israel and sort of exclusively. 
Israel, out of all the nations, out of all the peoples of all the world, were chosen by God to be his people. Now, you can take that and say, God has given us a special privilege, and God has given us a special responsibility to the world. Or you can take that idea and use it to exclude the rest of the world. After all, we're God's people, the rest of them are not. Now, that was Israel's mistake. But Peter is quick to remind us that this calling to be God's chosen people in the world is both privilege and responsibility. And that there are many more out there who are yet to come into the fold of being God's called, chosen people. We have the privilege of being able to go out there and tell them about it. Now, if you're beginning to wonder with this identity, this transformation that is occurring within you, this, this designation of who you are as the people of God, and this calling to proclaim His, His excellencies, then you're beginning to wonder, I hope you're beginning to wonder, what is it that God wants me to do? Lord, what are you calling me to do? Ought, ought to be the question on our minds and hearts. Many, many years ago, my pastor, Brother Jim, asked me, I was just hanging around, and I wanted to talk to him, but I was afraid to bother him. And, but after a while, he just sort of breached the, sub, breached the subject here. He said, what's going on between you and the Lord, Tom? And nobody had ever asked me that, that, that before, you know. And I knew I was dealing with the Lord about something, but I didn't really, I didn't really have words for it. A young Christian, brand new Christian. I didn't grow up in church, so I didn't know all the church lingo and all that stuff. And, and so, so I began to just talk with him and share with him. And, and what had happened was I had begun to feel an interest in going into the ministry, uh, feeling a sense of being called to preach is how I put it. That's, all I, that's the only language I had, had ever heard. So, so I'm wrestling with this. Now, the only thing about it was I had a, real ma I had a big problem with this. Because I had heard the testimony from a number of guys who said that God was laid heavy on my heart and tried to push me into this work. And, and, and I did not want to do it, but I finally said yes, and it's the best thing I ever did. You've heard that testimony before, right? The reluctant, obedient servant. You know, I'd heard that testimony. And so I had the idea that if I was interested in doing something, if I wanted to do something, that it couldn't be right because God always wants you to do what you don't want to do. I mean, that's the kind of God he is, right? And so, so I'm wrestling with this and I'm saying, Brother Jim, I, I'm thinking I want to go into the ministry. I'm, I'm thinking, I, thinking God called me to preach. And, and Brother Jim was, was, was wise in a lot of ways. He listened and, and, and he finally responded. He said, you know, I cannot tell you what God wants you to do. But he said, you must continue asking him, Lord, what are you calling me to do? And he used that language, that same language that we're using in this campaign, asking God what he wants us to do to be involved in what he's calling us to do. He said, you have to keep asking, Lord, what are you calling me to do? And then, then he gave me some tough counsel, really tough counsel. I, I'm so new to the faith and so new to the church and all that stuff. He said, read your Bible and pray about it. Can you believe that? Can you believe that he expected me, a brand new Christian with no real understanding of what's going on, even a couple of years old in the faith, read your Bible and pray about it as if I had to get my information from God himself. Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, the first crisis I had as a pastor in the church had to do with this very, very issue because I had become convicted by that point several years later. I had become convicted by that point that the Bible was the word of God for all the people of God and we get the most benefit from the word of God if we engage it privately. So I'm asking my little church, my little church with a youth group that began at 60 years old, I'm, I'm asking my church, Bring your Bibles to church. I'm going to preach from the Bible and you can read along. And this one guy got really, really mad at me. 
He's sold up. He didn't have a Bible with him, so he couldn't slam it closed. He just sold up, and he waited for me at the end of the service. And you know what he had to say to me? He said, we pay you to read the Bible to us. And he was so mad that he was ready to quit the church. And we couldn't afford to lose him. But the first crisis I ever had in, in my Christian life, based upon a conviction that the Bible is the word of God for all the people of God, and we make the best use of it if we all engage the Bible. How else can we hear what God is saying to us? The call of God is conveyed most strongly through the word of God. And prayer? Oh, it's, I've, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed listening to the guys that prayed last week and this week and uh, because of their just quoting scripture in the context of prayer that's exactly what the Bible does for us to enhance our, our prayer lives but when we pray we're asking Lord what are you calling me to do and it's that it's that search, that seeking, that desire to know, that, that engaging God so that we can get a hold of what it is He made us for and why He called us to be His child and what He wants us to do in life. It's in that engaging God in that way that we will grow, especially when we discern and discover what it is He wants us to do. So I'm glad my, my pastor thought that I really should engage God directly. And I believe, are you ready for this? What do you think I believe? I believe you should engage God directly. Asking him, Lord, what are you calling me to do? That's for all of us, every one of us in this place. Taking your responsibility for the work that God has called us as a church to do and you as his person to do with that church. Amen? I believe you should engage them. So I want to speak very practically uh, about this and I'm going to run quickly through this. There, there are six or seven or eight, ten points there and um, uh, so I'm going to kind of compress them as best I can. I want to speak very practically uh, about how we can discover and discern the call of God in our lives and I'm using an article that I found uh, by F.B. Myers called The Secret of Guidance. So I'm adapting his material to our need right now and I'm processing it through my own uh, theological understanding and you know, I've, I've wrestled with this. But so the first thing that we need in order to discover and discern the call of God is pure motives. Pure motives. Um, and that's based upon this fact that by the grace of God we have been delivered from the grosser forms of sin that we've been called out of darkness into the, his marvelous light and, and so our lives are being transformed. We're changing as we go and, and we, we're, we're letting go of some of the more obvious sinful kinds of behaviors in our life. Now that the grace of God has delivered us from that, we're inclined to act more and more in accord with our new nature in Christ. In other words, now that we are Christians, we are learning to live as Christians. Now that we have become children of God, we are learning to live Christianly, which is different in many respects from the life that you had before you met Christ. A Christian life is a, is a different kind of life from the life of the person who does not know Jesus. So that, let's, just, let's just understand that. And so we're beginning to do that because we've been delivered from the grosser forms of sin. And Jesus did an amazing thing. He blessed the people he called the pure in heart. That's Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 8. The pure in heart are happy, said Jesus, because they shall see God. Now, if you want to see God, then a kind of purification on the inside needs to take place, right? You need to start divesting yourself of the clutter and of the of the the things that pull you in various directions that keep you from being able to focus on God. And especially to take your eyes off of yourself 
and your self-interest and what brings you satisfaction and, and what blesses you, you know, you're, it's a change of focus to put your attention on, on God. Now, those people who do that, and by the way, that's a lifelong process of doing it. Those people that do that are happy. That's what Jesus said. Not just blessed in some vague sort of way, some, some you know, blessed, whatever that means, you know. He used a word that means happy. So we who that, that would purify our hearts, that would will the one thing to do what pleases God, are the happy people in the world. True happiness do that. Number two, if we want to discover and discern the call of God, is a surrendered will. We need to have a surrendered will. Uh, John 7, 17 says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know. That's not all the verse, but he says, he will know some things. Some things will become true for him. Things that are already true will become a burning reality in, in that person's life. If anyone determines, has the desire, and chooses to do the will of God, then they will know. That's a wonderful statement of Scripture. It, it's, it's a surrendered life that we're talking about and a surrendered will that follows the example of Jesus' Gethsemane prayer. You know the Jesus' Gethsemane prayer. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my, my will, but yours be done. Even the Son of God wrestled with self-interest in the Garden of Gethsemane, not having a, just a, a warm, fuzzy feeling about going to the cross and the suffering that would happen there, beginning in advance to suffer the pain and the agony and the anguish of, of being separated from the Father, knowing more about that form of suffering than any of us will ever know, he said, Father, if there's another way, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't end his prayer there. He said, nevertheless, not what I want, not what I choose, not what is good for me, but your will be done. That's the Gethsemane prayer. That's for all of us in the living of our lives. Day by day, we come to a lot of those crossroads experiences where we want to do something, but God has another will for us. And we're wise if we pray the Gethsemane prayer in that moment and say, not what I want, but what you want, your will be done. If we want to discover and discern the, the call of God in our lives, then number three, we need an informed mind. I like Tony Evans. Anybody listen to Tony Evans? Hear him on the radio. I enjoy listening to him. Black preachers and English preachers are among the most fascinating guys that you'll ever hear in your life. A, a British preacher can give a weather report and you'll just hang on every word because of the way they sound. Well, Tony Evans is a little bit like that. And Tony Evans has this idea. He says, feed our minds with facts. Facts. Great word, facts. Give your minds reliable information, trustworthy kind of information. Think about the results of your personal experiences in life. That's what wisdom is built on, is the living of life, and, and you're evaluating what the consequences of your commitments and decisions really are, where it takes you, and so the results of your experiences, that's, that's the kind of thing, you latch onto that, grab that, that's, that's God teaching you something, and he says, and above all, fill your mind with the word of God. And he says a very interesting thing. He says, because your feelings do not have a mind. Your feelings do not think. He's right about that. But how many of us are driven to decide by our feelings more than our intelligence, than by our, our mind? I'm not anti-feeling, but neither am I anti-intellect. Of all the people on the face of the earth, the most thoughtful ought to be 
God's people. Amen? Tony Evans says, feed your mind with facts because feelings do not have a mind. Myers observes the Bible is full of history and bi biography. That's an interesting sort of thing. Most of us don't like history, but a lot of us do enjoy little bits of history. And the wonder of, of knowing a little bit of history, especially the theological history that we find in the Bible and the story that's told from the beginning to the end of the book, you know, that, 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 that narrative that kind of covers everything, we find meaning for our stories in understanding that history. Myers under, understands that there's a great deal of history written in the book, but there's also a lot of biography in there. So you read stories about individuals, men and women and children who are just like you, who act like you do in certain circumstances. Sometimes they do the right thing. They're walking with God and they do the right thing. And they show, they set the bar, the bar high for us. The bar, <laughs> the bar high for us because of their devotion to the Lord. And sometimes they show us how really awful they can be. I think of one guy that does both of those for us. David. David, the poet of Israel, the writer of so many songs, psalms, poetry, to be used in worship in, in God's, uh, among God's people. He, he's way up there. He trusts the Lord. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. David, who commits adultery with Bathsheba. Who neglects his family. Who commissions murder. Who hits a low lower than anybody in this room has ever gone as far as I know. And you identify with people with biography in the scriptures. There's a reason. Because it pulls forth the best from you. If you see how God deals with ordinary human beings just like you and me. Who happen to be at the right place in the right time. And used by God to do what he wanted to do. It's an amazing and wonderful thing. David relied on some unique men in his administration. The men of Issachar they're called. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. He trusted them because they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. So when David's trying to be the king and he needs some help, he turns to these guys because they understand what today is all about. And they know what Israel should do. They know the direction to go. They just have this wisdom based upon the word of God. Don't we need, don't we need people just like that. Don't we need people like that who know the times and what we should do? We ought to pray for those souls. I believe they're here. They just may not be speaking up at this point. Many may come seeking counsel who are really not seeking counsel. I think we have in our immature, in our immature way of thinking, a desire for others just to tell us only what we want to hear. So, so here we go. We'll just look for someone to say what we want them to say about us and for us and to us. It's interesting, there are a lot of people that served as prophets in such a way. False prophets in the Old Testament were famous for currying the king's favor by telling him to do what they knew he wanted to do. And the real prophets of God who said, this is not the word of the Lord, got themselves in trouble if they dissented. So your desires and your feelings will clutter up this pursuit of knowing what God is calling to do, calling you to do. But the word of God in prayer will enable you to do what David frequently did. He inquired of the Lord as to what he should do, and then he did what the Lord told him to do. So the best counsel that you can give to another person 
is what drives a friend to interact with God through his word and through prayer. That's the very best you can do for your friend. Number four says a heart given to prayer. You can fill in the blank. I'm not going to talk about it right now. I'm running out of time. Sorry. (laughs) Number five is patience. Patience to wait for the unfolding of God's plan. I got to tell you, I have dreamed of doing what we're now doing for more than 20 years. As I've reflected on, on this church, just beginning to get to know you, I found, I found a report in the garbage that had been done four years before I got here. And it meant so much to, to the church at that time that it was worthy of the garbage. And there were some profound suggestions in, in, that, in that report. And I read that thing and I thought, wow, this is cool. I wish they'd started doing this. But I found out there were some features of it that leadership in the congregation said no. We're not going to do it. And the reason they said we're not going to do it is it costs too much. So I began praying. There's some good stuff in there, God. And I remember praying over and over again as if I was answering God. What do you want to do? As if God said, what do you want to do? I prayed, God, I want to build a church from the inside out. I want us to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus. You've heard me quote that a lot over the years. I want us to grow in our basic relationship with you, but I want us to expand. And so I knew there was a combination of internal, the journey within that needed to take place, but I knew there was also a lot of stuff we needed to do on the outside. So here we are, focusing on what we've been, what I've been thinking about for more than 20 years in the life of the church. You've got to be patient. You've got to be patient. A lot of stuff has come and gone between then and now. Number six, active pursuits. At some point, at some point, you have a hunch, a sense of what God wants you to do but you haven't really answered the call of God until you do something. Until you put your name on the dotted line, until you cast your lot, until you make the commitment, until you're ready to go and do. And we're getting closer to the go and do part of it. And we're going to ask you to make a commitment. To make a commitment for three years. To give whatever God tells you to give so that we can do some renovation and updating in the building and we can do some new construction so that we can get out of the four walls of the church, the metaphorical four walls of the church, and get across the street and around the corner and and up on the other side of town, building bridges to our neighbors so we can, until... We do something actively. We've not answered the call of God. Jesus made a statement. Matthew 22, 14 says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Let me unpack that. The called, those who hear. A lot of people hear the call of God. The chosen, those who respond. Not as many of those. But I call you on the authority of God's word in the spirit with, that has been working among us for these many months now to respond, to do something, to get ready to go and grow and build for the glory of God. Amen? Let's bow. Our Father, we thank you. 
We thank you that you call us. We thank you that your desire for us is that we would tell people about you. How wonderful you are. How great it is to serve you. How joyful we are just to know you. We pray, our Father, that you so, so move us by the call that you extend to each of us that we would go joyfully, hopefully, serving. Bless these moments of decision. For all of us in this place have to decide at some point, Lord, what are you calling me to do? We've got to do it. So help us. We ask in Jesus' name, for his sake.